going to read from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 44. And the title of this message is called The Tears of God. Just listen to this reading. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. Actually, I could say, we could just stop there and just talk about the whole verse all day. We're not going to. The Lord needs it, that cult. We could say about the Lord needs you. The Lord needs us. He needs people who will carry his message. Not because he wasn't able to do it himself, but because that's the way he designed it to be, that we would become co-workers and um, fellow witnesses with him. We'll continue. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, Even if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another, because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. Recently, myself and Meldy personally have invested in a lot of high-tech equipment, video equipment that... uh, you know, when my book comes out, we plan to use, but also to use it as a, a vehicle to make, um, you know, videos. Because I really believe that what's happening, especially in Western civilization, and it's not a mistake what's happening here. There's social engineering um, going on in Western civilization that is changing the very fabric of how we have known things for, for hundreds of years. And it's all built on a falsehood. It's all built on a lie. And one of the videos we're going to make, so if you see me around the church doing videos sometimes with a, a, a group of people, you'll understand what it is. And one of the uh, videos we're going to make at some point is the, um, the father of truth or the father of lies. And um, we'll just see how our very humanity is being undermined in what's happening. And as I think about this country, its great Christian witness over hundreds of years, centuries, it's not been easy. You know, there's been its ups and downs and, and, and so forth. But now we're seeing the fabric. And I do believe that the heart of God cries over what's happening to this country because of some of the things that uh, are taking place before our um, very eyes. And the gospel of grace is before people, but they cannot see it. And today, Palm Sunday, is the day when we as Christians celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, which took place the week before his death and resurrection. And for us, it marks the beginning of Holy Week, which concludes on Easter Sunday. Now, a long time before this, there was another king who wanted to give his people a new lease of life. And he decided to capture a city that none of his people had ever lived in before and to make it his capital. 
And the problem was the city was perched high on a rocky crack and was very easy to defend from an attack. And it was the reason the king wanted it as his capital. He thought, if I could get this, we can become almost indestructible if we can actually capture this city. And so the inhabitants of this city saw this king and his upstart army, and so confident were they in their defences, they gathered on the walls and they mocked him. And they said, we don't even need guards to protect these walls. This is how powerful this city is. They mocked him. They said, the blind and the lame could actually stop you from coming into this city. And so this king was a clever fella, and his name was David. King David and his story is told in the Bible. He knew that a city needed water. So if you look in the history of the kings and so on, he searched and found where their water supply came from. He found the springs and the water shafts they used to get water into the city. So he said it's been a challenge. He said, then to the city, he said, fight your way to the gates, open them for us, and the first one to do it will become my general. Instant promotion, instant wealth, and lots of rewards. And in that way, he captured the city, and that king, as I said, was David. And his story is told in the Bible how he captured, captured Jerusalem. It's told in the books of Samuel, Chronicles, Kings, and so on. And so it's not a coincidence that here, the Jewish people, years later, they find themselves in a terrible situation. They are oppressed by the imperial Rome, a very, very cruel and destructive empire. When you look at their practices of crucifixion, gladiatorial combat, and so forth, it was very cruel. The temple taxes and most of what people earned was taken from Jerusalem back to Rome and was made to build their great architectural buildings, which we still see today, or the statues to their gods in the city of Rome. So can you imagine how resentful we would be if everything we was earning, a large majority of it, was being extorted so we didn't have enough to live on and it was being taken to foreign cities to build these great structures and to these gods and so forth. There'd be a lot of resentment. So you can imagine when they think that somebody's coming to deliver them from this, to deliver them from the power of Rome, the people are absolutely jubilant. That's why they're saying Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The story of Jesus' grand entry into Jerusalem is an example of a mismatch between people asking God for help and then having the wrong expectations when that answer actually comes. And what I want to say to you this morning, and this has certainly been my experience even in my own life, many Christians do not like the answer God often gives to their prayers. Because when we pray and we say, Lord, will you do this or will you do that? We have an expectation of what to expect. And when God actually does it differently, I've seen so many people become disillusioned or disheartened. Well, that wasn't what we expected God to do. We wanted you to do it this way, Lord, but you did it that way. And that is such a powerful lesson for us to, to learn, that sometimes we really need to readjust our expectations of how God will answer prayer, and he will answer prayer. Because just think of this, that everybody travelling this road, when Jesus is coming in, just the very next day, the disappointment started to set in. My goodness, who does he think he is? And you start to see how disillusionment set in, so much so that the same crowd, just a few days later, were shouting, crucify him, kill him. What happened between today and a few days on Friday that changed their mind so much? God's plans are always much better than our plans when it comes to the things of his kingdom. And people thought a king was coming to topple the power of the Rome that he was the new King David who would take back Jerusalem from the imperial yoke of Rome. It will be our city again, just like David did. He will capture it, he will take it, Rome will be kicked out. What a fantastic guy this Jesus is. Hosanna to the King of David. Here's some palm branches, here's our cloaks, here's a cult. This is fantastic news. 
and yet God had something far greater in mind. I'll just tell you the story because it came to me this morning. I know, you, I know you'll see the irony of this as well. But I knew this man once. He was a lovely fella. But he once called me and he said, I've been praying and fasting for two weeks that God would give me a job. And he said, I'm so disappointed it's not happened. And I asked him, have you actually been down to the job centre during those two weeks? He said, no, I haven't. I said, think about it. Think very carefully about this. Do you really think that an employer's or a businessman is going to be driving past your bedsit, which is where this guy lived, that you suddenly get this great revelation, there's somebody in there, I need to offer him a job, knock on the door, I've got this fantastic job for you. I said, you need to put action to your prayers. So many times we as Christians, we forget that. But here, Jesus travelled to Jerusalem knowing that this journey would end in his sacrificial death on the cross for the sins of mankind. And before they entered the city, he sent two disciples ahead to the village of Bethpage to look for an unbroken colt. And then men brought the colt to Jesus and placed their cloaks on his back. And that's a symbolism, if you know your Bibles in the book of Judges, that um, the judges and their sons would either ride on donkeys or the son of one of the judges of Israel would ride on a colt. So it's a symbol that Jesus was coming to um, judge. He also came as a king because a donkey is a, a beast that kings rode on when they were on missions of peace because he was coming in humility and peace, not as a revolutionary. And so the crowds began to stir that this was going to be different. There's a sense of excitement and anticipation. And as Jesus sat on the young donkey, he slowly made his humble entrance into Jerusalem. And as I say, we see the people greeted him very enthusiastically. The celebration quickly spread throughout the whole city. One of the things we've been looking at recently... And as we think here that Jesus came as a, as a king, as a judge, as a prophet, and so forth, he wept for Jerusalem because he could see the judgment that was coming. And yet at that time, he was coming to bring them peace. And the people, they didn't fully understand what he was doing yet. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him, if you look at Matthew's account of this same event Yes, replied Jesus, have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth praise? So I want to say this, I'm not going to speak for too long this morning. But there were two marches going on in Jerusalem at that day. Here was Jesus marching into the west side of the city. The people are laying palm branches and um, cloaks down for him and yet on the other side of the city the Romans were also entering because they realised that the Jewish people were often capable of revolt and capable of um, having riots during their religious festivals so you had this Roman legions marching into Jerusalem can you just imagine the spectacle of that entry if it was being reported on the news today from television it would be quite a sight wouldn't it that here's one person coming on a, a humble colt with all these people throwing palm branches from their, their coats before him and calling him the son of David as he's being led into the city. And then on the other side of the city, this legion of Roman soldiers being led by Pontius Pilate, clad in leather, their armour polished to a high gloss glinting in the sunlight. On each centurion's head, hammered helmets would be gleaming. At their side, sheathed in the scabbards, their swords would be crafted from the hardest steel. And in their hands, each of them carried a spear. And one of them, in a few days' time, was about to go into Christ's side. If they was an archer, they'd be carrying a bow with a sling of arrows across their back. Drummers would be beating out the cadence of the march. And so here we are. The people, they come from one side... They come from the other. Their expectation is, probably, there's going to be some sort of riot. The Romans will end up fleeing the city. King David has done what he's called to do. 
And if you look on the next passage, what did it say Jesus did? It says he went into the temple and he had a look around. He came to his people and he looked at what they were doing. And then it says he left and so on. Verse 44, we'll close with this. It says, they will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. The people there didn't recognise that Christ was coming not to have a physical battle, not to start a war, not to start a riot. He was coming to make a way for every human being to be able to come to God through Christ's sacrificial death and thereafter his resurrection. And this should be our message to the people of this generation. Recognise God's time now. It's so important for us as Christians. Time is the most precious thing we have in this life. Just imagine you've got a bank account, okay? And somebody... Every single day, well, I say just imagine you've got a bank account. You've all got bank accounts. You know what I mean. But just imagine that every day, each morning, somebody puts £86,400 into that bank account. One second past midnight, you get £86,400 put in it. But here's the catch. If you don't use it, by the end of midnight the next day, it resets to zero. And then at one minute past, you've got £86,400 back in the bank account. Now, I don't know about you, I'd be trying to withdraw every single penny and pound I could, you know, at that time, so that it wouldn't be wasted. But in a sense, that's similar to our lives, that every morning we have 86,400 seconds in a day to live. They're not going to come back again. Once they're gone, they are gone. Each day, it's a new account for us. There's no going back, and time is one of the most valuable of all of our resources in this life. Because once it's lost or wasted, it can never be regained. Time spent doing something you enjoy is not always wasted. Please understand that. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, doesn't it? It says there's a time for everything. There's a time for being born, a time for dying, a time for sleeping and so forth. We even see with Jesus that there was a time when at the wedding of Cana, he was relaxing. When his mother came to him and said, they ran out of wine, will you do something? And he was, my time's not yet come, woman. I think I've told you the story before. And... um, Two young, I had uh, a mother in our first church who had about four or five, I can't remember, was it uh, four, four teenage uh, boys? And they were challenging, let's put it that way. They were challenging young lads. Um, they didn't have a father on the scene. Uh, you know, the, um, me and Melody tried to help where we could to give them sort of like guidance and uh, had a really good relationship with these um, young fellows and the family to try and help them. And one day the mother came to church and she said, Sean, she said, um, she said, I'm really frustrated, she said, because they started calling me woman. I said, what do you mean? They said, we'll be in the supermarket. And they say, woman, put some coke in the, uh, you know, in the uh, trolley. Or woman, do this, woman, do that. She says, please, could you speak to them? So I said, okay. So I got these teenage boys into the, my office and I said, okay. I said, what's going on? They said, well, you told us in your sermon last week to follow the example of Christ. I said, yes, what do you mean? But he said to his mother, woman, do this, <laughs> And, okay, that's not quite what I meant, but, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun with those guys. But the point I'm making is, there is a time for everything. It's not wasted time when we run acts with family. It's not wasted time when we sleep, when we work, and stuff like that. But what we do need to realise, there's also things which we will do in this life, that sometimes the time can be gone if we don't use it wisely. This time for Jesus wasn't the time to be relaxing at a wedding in Cana. It wasn't the time to be doing anything else apart from what God has called him to do. Let's pray. Mm. 
Heavenly Father, there's so much we can look at in this story. But you came for a specific purpose. We thank you, Lord, that the time we have in our lives, we can spend it in various and different ways. There's nothing wrong with relaxing. There's nothing wrong with doing the things we enjoy to do. As long as the focus of our lives is upon the mission that you called us to do. That applies to us individually, it applies to us as a church, Lord. There's different times when we will do different things. But help us be about the mission that you call us to do. And as we think of this holy week, that Christ came for a specific purpose. He disappointed many people because your plan for him, for us, was far greater than the people of that time could see. That he came not just to destroy the imperial yoke of Rome, but he came to destroy the yoke of death, sin, hell and destruction <coughs> over the human race. That now, Lord, when we stand before you, when we come by way of the cross, our sins are forgiven. There is no judgment against us because of what Christ did. Help us use our time wisely, Lord, to focus on the things that truly matter. Yes, to relax when we are tired, to spend time with family when the opportunity is there, but for our life, be focused towards doing those things you called us to do. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.